so uh, neuroendocrine tumors i want this session to be a bit uh, interactive so what is the most common site of neuroendocrine tumors in our body anyone i can see there are yuvraj gopal kirti rijuta rizhin sasi mohri okay anyone most common site of uh, neuroendocrine endocrine tumors in our body yuvraj sir as a whole is gi system but if a single organ is considered uh, bronchial carcinoid bronchial bronchial carcinoids yeah yeah single organ according to organ is bronchial and overall yeah. it's uh, the gi system in gi system what is the most common amongst the gi system most common site no one jejuno ileal so it's 40 to 45% followed by rectum which is around 30% followed by stomach and appendix and followed by duodenum and colon okay so how do these uh, neuroendocrine tumors present to us so most common is incidental since they are very uh, relatively very slow growing so gastric and duodenal they are generally uh, which they generally come to picture on endoscopy similarly rectal and terminal ileal on colonoscopy append or an appendix neuroendocrine tumor most commonly is uh, seen after an appendicectomy specimen and obviously pancreas multi director ct abdomen secondly they can present as as a symptomatic pathology based on the site size and the function so gastric neuroendocrine tumors there are three types of gastric neuroendocrine tumors right gastric neuroendocrine tumors type 1 type 2 type 3 anyone can tell that i don't know who all are there again i have to check yuvraj dr yuvraj who else is there no one chalo so type 1 is associated with chronic atrophic gastritis Hello. type two, yes sir uh, type 2 is associated with functional gastrinoma and type 3 they generally present with mass effect they are more than 2 cm high grade single lesion and high metastatic risk so type 1 is obviously associated with increased gastrin and decreased gastric acid type 2 both gastrin and gastric acid are increased and type 3 both gastrin and gastric acid are normal now duodenal neuroendocrine tumors may present with anemia jaundice or symptoms of zds golinga ellison syndrome jejuno ileal neuroendocrine tumors may present as pain bleeding and jaundice yeah. and uh, as i told colorectal neuroendocrine tumors mostly are incidental 70% and they although they may present as altered bowel habits bleeding and pain and <clears throat> again the most common presentation of uh, Uh, jejuno ileal neuroendocrine tumor is a desmoplastic reaction which is present in 50% of the of the cases so the in this cases the primary tumor is usually smaller and the surrounding fibrotic reactions which is due to serotonin so that leads to desmoplastic reaction and that may be the presenting feature of obstruction intestinal obstruction pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors 80% are non functional and 20% are functional which consists uh, which we'll deal with later okay so hormonal secretions gastric neuroendocrine tumors they may secrete histamine chromogranin a and uh, carcinoid syndrome is associated with small bowel small bowel neuroendocrine tumors that is serotonin we secrete serotonin mainly due to serotonin and the the characteristic of colorectal neuroendocrine tumors is that they don't have any hormonal symptoms since they only secrete pancreatic polypeptide coming to pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors we all know the most common functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is insulinoma which is the incidence of which is 40% and out of which only 10% is malignant on the contrary the other functional neuroendocrine pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors glucagonoma vipoma acth gnrh gastrinoma somatostenoma all are relatively very rare but when present they are mostly malignant and associated with or as i told before serotonin associated carcinoid syndrome and they may be uh, these syndromes uh, tumors may be associated with men men syndrome and nf1 i'll this will be dealt dealt with in the next slide so the genetic syndrome associated with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors anyone what are the genetic syndromes associated with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh anyone we don't have much time we have to complete fast 
one hour is very short. Anyone? No one? Dr. Dibya? Yuraj? Anyone? No one? Chalo. Okay. So, 80 to 90 percent are sporadic, 10 to 90 percent have only genetic association and duodenal neuroendocrine tumors generally associated men 1 and NF1. And as I told, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are associated most commonly associated with men 1, followed by VHL, NF1, tuberous sclerosis, and glucagon cell hyperplasia and neoplasia are rare. So, coming to the imaging modalities for gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Initially, I'll be, uh, this is, we are dealing with the uh, entire thing. Then on the coming, when we'll go to the treatment, we'll deal with each one of them separately. So we all know that initial diagnosis staging biopsy can be done with CT abdomen and pelvis, that is triple phase abdomen or MRI. And however, MRI is best for liver, pancreas, bone and brain. Apart from this, FDG PET has a role, but main, it's mainly, uh, its major role is for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors that is higher grade. Since they lose their somatostatin receptor expression. So in these cases, uh, FDG PET is relatively better. So CT abdomen pelvis has a sensitivity of 82 and 86 percent respectively. MRI has a 100 percent specificity for uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And we all know that uh, the gallium 68 dotated PET is now the most common functional imaging for neuroendocrine tumors. And it has a sensitivity of 92% and sensitivity of 88%. Apart from that, as I already told, for uh, gastric and duodenal neuroendocrine tumors, esophageal duodenoscopy, colonoscopy for rectum and colon, and endoscopic ultrasound for pancreatic neoplasms can be used for diagnosis and biopsy. The only indication of transabdominal ultrasound is for guided biopsy and liver metastasis. They are very sensitive and specific for liver metastasis, metastasis transabdominal ultrasound. And as I already mentioned, endoscopic ultrasound has the highest imaging sensitivity for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So the, the recommendations for the use of biomarkers for diagnosis and management, the NANETS, North American Neuroendocrine Society, European and NCCN, all have given their uh, guidelines. So commonly, promogranin A and urine 5-hydroxy indole acetic acid is used. Coming to a nuclear imaging for neuroendocrine tumors. So this can come as a question and this is also very interesting. So previously, uh, previ uh, previously I mean before the advent of uh, this gallium 68 DOTA, DOTA scans, we had Octrio scan, which used indium 111 pantriotride. After, the in, in, after this, we have gallium DOTA Tate, TOC and NOC. All are uh, different on the basis of their uh, binding to the specific SSTR receptors. DOTA Tate specifically binds to SSTR type 2, TOC for 5 and NOC for both 3 and 5. So what's the difference between Octrio scan and gallium DOTA scan? Why gallium DOTA scan has? replaced Octrio scan. So this is the table. We can see gallium 68 has a short half-life of nearly 68 minutes, whereas indium we had the half-life is around two to eight days. Also the radiation dose was higher, synthesis was, was costly. And in, for in gallium 68, the acquisition time is within two hours, whereas Indian 11, Indian four, when we used Indian 111, at that time we used to have uh, two scans. One was within four hours and the next was within 24 hours. Uh, it has a gallium 68 has a better resolu spatial resolution of PET CT and has a higher affinity for somatostatin receptors. And also the quantification of tracer uptake can be done, which was not possible for indium 111. So gallium has replaced indium 111 or Octrio scan now. And as I already mentioned, where uh, gallium DOTA versus FDG PET for poorly differentiated and less well differentiated tumors, we we use 18 FDG PET because they have high KS67 and due to higher glucose metabolism. And as I told that they have uh, lost the expression of SSTR receptors, high grade tumors. So FDG PET is more sensitive and specific in such tumors. For grade one and two and well differentiated tumors who have high expression SSTRs, gallium 68, DOTA PET CT is used. So what are the role, what is the role of gallium 68 DOTA PET CT in these? gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. First, for diagnosis. 
so pool sensitivity and specificity is different for everyone overall it's 93% 96% respectively dota tate has a sensitivity of around 90, 72 to 96% dota talk has 92 to 100% sensitivity and 80 to 90% specificity knock has again same sensitivity and the same specificity so false positives false positives can be seen in case of unseen process of pancreas inflammation certain vertebral uh, tumors such as hemangiomas fractures so these all can give rise to false positive in cases of gallium 68 dota pet ct scans secondly gallium dota can be used for the purpose of staging and five year survival is directly related to the localization and the development of metastasis so if the disease is localized the five year survival is nearly 96% in case of just nodal metastasis 77% and decreases to around 50% in cases of extra hepatic metastasis and we have to remember that surgery is the only curative treatment of neuroendocrine tumors i mean to say complete curative curative treatment although there are palliative treatments which we'll discuss later for metastatic tumors and currently prrt is also being used for palliation so for after diagnosis second role of gallium dota pet is for identification of unknown primary thirdly detection of recurrence and restaging to determine the eligibility for prrt prrt until unless the these tumors express somatostatin receptors prrt cannot be used so first we have to do this scan to know whether the uh, cells uh, the tumors express prrt or not uh, sorry sstr or not and only then prrt can be given lastly for to monitor response to therapy following a surgery or uh, chemotherapy whatever we'll discuss later yeah so who classification we all know this grade 1 and 2 and 3 based on ki67 and mitotic count ki67 less than 3% 3 to 20 and more than 20 mitotic count is less than 2 2 to 20 more than 20 grade 3 also called as polio differentiated neuroendocrine tumors or neuroendocrine carcinomas so now we'll deal with all the uh, gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors separately first coming to the management of small bowel neuroendocrine tumors so by definition this the small bowel is defined as located the tumors are located between ligament of treats and ileocecal wall it is the second most prom- common primary site for neuroendocrine tumor in git and small as someone already told it small bowel is the most common primary malignancy of small bowel mean age of presentation is a six decade and the peak is around 70 to 80 years so presentation nearly 30% may present in the form of distant metastasis and in 40% regional lymph node involvement most commonly they present with abdominal pain followed by bowel obstruction and as i already told that small bowel tumors or ileocecal neuroendocrine tumors they generally give right to carcinoid syndrome which was first described by thorsen and colleagues and this occurs in patients with liver metastasis characterized by flushing diarrhea bronchospasm and valvular heart disease so valvular heart disease most commonly right side due to high levels of serotonin which leads to fibrosis and whenever valvular heart disease is present is it indicates poor prognosis so evaluation against serum chromogranin a levels can be identified which are both sensitive and specific and useful in diagnosis prognosis and monitoring of response for imaging ct abdomen mri and usg for liver mets and functional imaging sstr expression is nearly present in 80 to 100 in sorry it's 100% of of patients so sstr gallium uh, dota pet ct is used in this for functional imaging coming to the surgical management for stage 1 to 3 tumors which are small and multifocal and within 100 cm 100 cm of ileocecal wall we can do a segmental resection ilocolic resection anastomosis and as i already told that more than 75% have mets to regional lymph nodes which are more prominent than the primary tumors and primary tumors are generally very small because of the desmoplastic reactions surrounding this desmoplastic reaction due to serotonin the optimal extent of lymphadenopathy is more than equal to 8 and although complete resection even if it's done long term recurrence rate is nearly 50% so surveillance should be done for at least 10 years every 6 to 12 months stage 4 tumors and systemic treatment would be discussed later i'll in the later as it would be common for all the tumors tumors for all from all the sites 
Coming to prognosis, stage one and one to three tumors have uh, disease specific survival rate 20 years, nearly 75%. Stage four tumors, median overall survival rate is 8.5%. So, even patients who go, who develop metastasis, the survival of a decade or more is achievable with modern multimodal therapy, which again I will describe what all therapies we can use in cases of metastasis. Coming to gastric and duodenal neuroendocrine tumors. So as I told, there are three types of gastric neuroendocrine tumors, type 1, 2, and 3. Most common is type 1, and the least common is type 2. So type 3 is the most uh, uh, malignant one and the most dangerous one. Generally, the size is more than 2 centimeters. It, uh, it is associated with metastasis in almost 50 to 100 percent of pregnancy. Uh, for, oh, sorry, almost 50 to 100 percent of patients. And uh, the serum gastrin and pH, gastric pH are normal in this, as I described earlier. Type 1 associated with uh, chronic atrophic gastritis and type 2 with ZES in men 1. So, coming to location and the clinical features, duodenal neuroendocrine tumors mostly are non functional, and when functional, they are associated with Zollinger Ellison syndrome. They are mucosal or submucosal based up to 2 centimeters and 40 to 60 percent have METs to regional lymph nodes and nearly 10 percent have liver metastasis. Evaluation again, nothing specific for this. The esophagogastrodonoscopy and EUS can be used apart from that serum gastrin gastric pH for gastric uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Imaging again the same and also functional imaging can be used. Coming to the surgical management. So, Type 1 and type 2 gastric neuroendocrine tumors are clubbed together and type 3 which is more aggressive and have more potential for metastasis, the only treatment for them is surgical resection while type 1 and 2 if they are less than 1 centimeters, esophagogastrododenoscopic surveillance versus endoscopic resection, both we can give the option to the patient and when they are, even when they are less, in, less than 6. However, if they are more than 2 centimeters and less than 6 in number, endoscopic resection versus surgical resection should be, both options should be given to the patient and we should proceed as, as required. And when they are more than 2 centimeters and more than 6 in number, then in that case, the proper surgical resection in the form of partial gastrectomy, antrectomy or could be done. And in spite, as I told, in spite of complete resection, non the long-term recurrence of small bowel tumors is neuroendocrine tumors is nearly 50 percent. So surveillance for at least 10 years every 6 to 12 months should be done. Coming to duodenal neuroendocrine tumors, less than 1 centimeter endoscopic resection, more than 2 centimeters surgical resection. However, there is a debate between <laughs> the tumor size between 1 to 2 centimeters what to do. And grade 2 or 3 tumors and proximal, proximity to ampulla of Vater, again surgical resection is preferred mostly in the form of Whipple's procedure. And resection of lymph nodes, re regional lymph nodes, generally type 3 gastric neuroendocrine tumors and gastrinomas, we need to do, uh, uh, we need to resect the uh, regional lymph nodes and the, it should be an on-block lymphadenectomy. So prognosis, 5-year survival of for the gastric neuroendocrine tumors is overall is 49%. And disease specific for type 1 is nearly 100%, whereas for type 3 is 75%. For duodenal neuroendocrine tumors, if in cases of localized disease, the five-year survival is around 80 to 95%. For local regional disease, which involves the lymph node, it's 65 to 75%. And for, patient, for patients who have distant meds on presentation, the five-year survival in cases of duodenal neuroendocrine tumors is 20 to 40% only. Now coming to the neuroendocrine tumors of appendix, colon, and rectum. So as I already told that the neuroendocrine tumors of appendix, nearly 80% are diagnosed incidentally on pathologic review of appendicectomy specimen and in colon and rectum incidentally during screening colonoscopy or rarely they can also present as change in bowel habits or bleeding PR. And among colon and rectum, rectum is, the incidence in rectum is more common as compared to colon and they are non-functional. So imaging in cases of uh, appendix, if we have done a R0 resection, it's an early stage tumor and no high risk features, then imaging is not indicated for neuroendocrine tumors of appendix. However, 
if the tumor is well differentiated in 1 to 2 cm, CT, MRI, abdomen or pelvis for lymph node and metastasis should be done. If it is more than 2 cm or more than 3 mm invasion of mesoappendix or if the margins are positive in initial appendicectomy specimen, then functional imaging should be done. For colon and rectum, any tumor of more than 1 cm in size or high risk features, pelvic MRI and rectal ultrasound should be done. So, except in very low risk diseases such as tumors which are less than 2 cm low grade with negative margin or less than 1 cm low grade rectal nets, the functional imaging that is a gallium 68 DOTA PET CT should be considered for staging. So, coming to the location of these tumors in cases of uh, in case of appendix it is present in the tip in 60 to 75 percent of the patient body 5 to 20 percent and base less than 10 percent usually they are low to intermediate grade and as a carcinoid syndrome is not very common however in fact it is extremely rare and only present in cases of metastatic disease colon they can occur throughout colon and they are more aggressive and poorly differentiated and nearly 40 percent are high grade tumors in rectum, generally present in the mid, mid rectum and roughly 5 to 10 centimeter from the anal verge. So, coming to the surgical management, the 2 centimeter is the landmark, less than 2 centimeter and confined to appendix, already appendicectomy if, if done, nothing else needs to be done. However, if it's less than 2 centimeter but located at the base or we have, an, we have had an incomplete resection or it's an intermediate or high grade tumors with lymphovascular invasion or mesoappendix invasion, then we should consider a right hemicolectomy. Whereas in patients who have tumor size more than 2 centimeters or they have a positive lymph node or positive margin, right hemicolectomy should be done. And in case of metastatic disease, multidisciplinary evaluation and the management, which we'll discuss later for all metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. For colon, again, if it's a local regional disease, segmental resection with lymph adenectomy and metastatic disease, again, multidisciplinary evaluation should be done. However, in low to intermediate grade tumors, which are less than 2 cm, European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, uh, they say we should do endoscopic excision, whereas NIAID say a right hemicolectomy should be done. For rectum, again, if it's uh, less than 2 centimeters, endoscopic or trans resection can be done. And if it's more than 2 centimeters or if lymph nodes are present, low anterior resection or abdominal, abdominal perineal resection should be done. Coming to the prognosis, the 5-year survival for appendiceal neuroendocrine tumors, overall it's around 100%. Regional disease in which there is only lymph node metastasis, again, 80 to 100 percent. But however, in cases of distant mets, it considerably falls to less than 25 percent. In cases of colon, as we already told, that as I already told, colon neuro neuroendocrine tumors are very extremely uh, malignant and they are, or the oral survival is only 40 to 70 percent. The worst survival among small bowel tumors. And rectal neuroendocrine tumors have the best overall cancer-specific survival among neuroendocrine tumors of lung and small bowel, stomach, colon, and pancreas. So the worst is colonic neuroendocrine tumors and the best prognosis is rectal neuroendocrine tumors. So we should remember this. Coming to the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So it consists of 10% of all pancreatic malignancies and unlike other gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, they are diagnosed at a higher stage with nearly 40% having distant metastasis at presentation. And I had already mentioned more than 85, 80 to 85% are non-functional and 15, 20% are functional, which are associated with men one in 80 to 100% of cases, 10 to 15% of VHL associated, less than 10% NF1 and also tuberous sclerosis, which is uncommon. The WHO classification is again grade 1, 2 and 3 well differentiated and grade 3 is poorly differentiated which is also called as neuroendocrine tumor. It's the same KI67 and mitotic count less than 3, 3 to 20, more than 20, less than 2, 2 to 20 and more than 20. During For evaluation, we can use endoscopic ultrasound, serum chromogranin levels again and pancreastatin. In imaging, multidirector CT abdomen is the best imaging modality. 
along with MRI also and ultrasound for liver meds and functional imaging obviously can be done in these cases. If coming to the location, it depends on the type of tumor. As we all know, insuluma can represent anywhere and can be single or multiple. So, metrostatinoma, generally pancreatic head or duodenal ampulla. Vipoma is present in the tail. Gastrinoma is most commonly present in the duodenum. And the non-functional tumors have no predilection. They can be present anywhere throughout the pancreas. Coming to the surgical management, for all functional and localized pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, surgery is recommended. And if the size is more than 2 centimeters, we should also do a regional lymphadenectomy. For tumors in the pancreatic head, again, Whipple's procedure, pancreatic or duodenectomy. For body and tail, distal pancreatomy can be done with or without splenectomy. For parenchymal and other parenchymal sparing enucleation for small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which does not involve main pancreatic duct. And the, these tumors, uh, the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, have the worst five-year survival of all gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which is around 35%. So, despite the high number of patients presenting with stage 4 disease, the prognosis of patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is favorable when compared with other malignancies of pancreas of similar stage, like pancreatic adenocarcinoma. If it has, for a similar stage, pancreatic adenocarcinoma and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor will have a better prognosis. So, now we'll deal with the management of metastatic gastroenteropancreatic tumors as a whole. So, most common site of metastasis is liver, around 44%, followed by peritoneum and bone. So, for firstly, the management of hepatic metastasis, there are four options, surgical site reduction, ablation procedures, intra-arterial therapies, and lastly, liver transplantation. So, we'll deal with each one of them one by one. Firstly, surgical cytoreduction. So, the indication is well-differentiated tumors which are grade 1 and grade 2 or grade 3 tumors which have only isolated metastasis in patients with low mobility, obviously. So, the principle is, is like <clears throat> even in patients with diffuse bilobal disease, uh, bilobar involvement of the liver, R0 resection is not required to achieve a comparable oncologic outcomes and also negative margin is not required. So, even if there is a tumor, we do a tumor debulking of 70%, then it is enough for hepatic metastasis in case of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So, remember this that R0 resection and negative margins are not required in these cases. And <coughs> The procedures can be anatomical hepatic resection, parenchymal sp sp sparing procedures such as enucleation, wedge resection. As I had already told, the deep bulking threshold has been fixed around 70%, which has been established for surgical side reduction. And it may lead to relief of symptoms from carcinoid syndromes without these the somatostatin injections. And it has a survival advantage, obvious survival advantage over medical therapy alone, like long acting somatostatin, LAR or pacidotide, landriotide. If the patient is only on medical therapy, then he's uh, doing a surgical removal, surgical resection in case of liver metastasis. Patient would be relieved of his symptoms. However, the recurrence rate at 5 years is around 84% and 10 years it's around 95%. Coming to the ablation, ablative procedures. So, we can do a radio frequency ablation for lesions less than five, uh, less than two centimeters, and MVA, that is microwave ablation, can be done for lesions up to five centimeters. Again, the debulking threshold of seventy percent can be achieved, even when there are more than ten metastases. And the benefits of these procedures is that they can reach lesions that would be difficult to resect surgically. The intra-arterial therapies, there are, these are four types, trans-arterial bland embolization, which causes selective ischemia, chemoembolization, chemoembolization using drug eluting stents, and radioembolization using yttrium 90 microspheres. So these are all upcoming, uh, these are all therapies which can be used in case of liver metastasis. So the last option is a liver transplantation, although not very promising, but this is the only indication of liver transplantation in metastatic setting and as we all know there is a Milan classification for liver tumors this is a Milan criteria for liver transplantation in case of transplantation in case of neuroendocrine tumor metastasis 
So the, what is the criteria? The patient should be less than 55 years, KS67 less than 5%. It should be a well-differentiated tumor, less than 50% of the liver should be involved. And the primary tumor should be completely resected and there should not be any extrahepatic metastasis. However, there is a lack of level level evidence when comparing it to other treatment modalities. So it is not very frequent. And the contraindications are again uh, grade 3 or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors if there is tumor progression or extrahepatic disease, as I already told, which are not the inclusion criteria. Coming to the peritoneal metastasis, which is present in around 15% of the patients. So generally, it is used to prevention and treatment of bowel obstruction, intestinal hemorrhage, avoid the complications of fibrosis, and for treatment of portal hypertension. Options are regional peritoneal resection, peritoneal stripping, HIPEC, and electrocautery or argon beam for small lesions. Moving on to the medical management. I think we all, all of you should be knowing this. So most common type of SSTR receptor is SSTR type 2. And in cases of well-differentiated tumors, as I have told many times during my talk, in cases of well-differentiated tumors, which are grade 1 and grade 2, they are almost 80 to 100% of these tumors express SSTR. And currently, there are two US FDA approved somatostatin analogs which can which are which can be used based on the PROMI trial. We have octreotide LAR which can be used 30 mg subcutaneous deep iron every uh, sorry subcutaneous every 28 days and landriotide based on Clannet trial 120 mg every 28 days. Also, pesiriotide although not approved, they can be used but although they have a higher rates of grade three and grade four hyperglycemia. So most commonly at our center, we use long-acting octreotide. So chemotherapy, although not very promising, and there are not many trials or uh, this uh, not very, you know, promising and useful. But however, streptozocin is the only FDA-approved chemotherapeutic agents, and captem, that is capecitabine, capecitabine and temozolomide can be used for palliation, and. This should be considered as an initial treatment in patients with advanced tumors with significant tumor burden and especially when symptomatic and if rapid progressive clinical course is noted, these can be used. Chemotherapy. A few targeted therapies. The only FDA approved TKI for uh, gastroenteropancreatic neurogen tumor is sunitinib. Other than that, pazopanib, cabozantinib, lenvatinib, axantinib can be used. Based on the radiant trial, Evrolimus also can be used. Now, this is the last topic for today. That is PRRT manage, role of PRRT, peptide receptor therapy. So the two most common, again, this can come as a short note, role of PRRT management of neuroendocrine tumors. So there are two most common radionucleotides which are used for uh, PRRT. The first one is uh, <clears throat> yttrium 90 dota talk, and the second is lut lutetium 177 dota 8. So at our center, uh, the nuclear medicine colleagues use lutetium 177. So the mechanism of action of lutetium is it binds to somatostatin receptor on the cell surface, and then it is internalized to the cytoplasm. It emits long-acting uh, beta radiations with uh, which generate free radical and reactive oxygen species, which leads to DNA damage. So what are the indications? The indications are again, it should be low grade, non-operable, low grade, mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, and who have disease progression on somatostatin analogs, or non-operable grade three gastroenteroneuroendocrine tumors, lung carcinoids, as it can also be used as salvage therapy after recurrence of progression and can also be used in cases of as a new adjuvant therapy in non resectable neuroendocrine tumors. So, there are certain prerequisites for PRRT. The first one is that obviously the tumor should express SSTR, and we assert, ascertain that by using a DOTA, talk, DOTA scan before this therapy. Patient should have a good renal function. The GFR should be more than 50. Should have a sufficient bone marrow reserve, hemoglobin more than 8, TLC count more than 2,000, and platelet count at least more than 70,000, since these are all side effects. 
and bilirubin and other liver functions should be less than less than three times the upper limit. It should be given only three to four weeks after the last octreotide therapy. And however, the short acting octreotide could be discontinued 12 to 24 hours prior and restarted six hours after the infusion. So how it is administered? It is generally administered in four to six cycles of 200 millicurie each, generally eight weeks apart since it has a hematologic and renal toxicity. So to settle down and prevent that, it is given eight weeks or eight weeks apart. Duration is almost around 20 to 30 minutes. And also concurrent IV cationic amino acid in the form of lysine arginine is used for four hours duration. And it should be started 30 minutes prior to initial lutetium therapy. Why? Because these are nephrotoxic and these anions prevent or decrease the nephrotoxic effect of PRRT. Coming to the adverse effects, number one, again, as I told, renal, renal toxicity, and it, it causes thrombotic microangiopathy due to endothelial damage, as these, like they, they, they kill the normal cells, they also damage the endothelial cells of the uh, renal vessels due to beta radiation. It can also lead to neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. Uh, apart from that, MDS, that is myelodysplastic syndrome or acute leukemia can be used in less, uh, can occur in less than 2%. Flushing and diarrhea and carcinoid crisis can also occur during administration in 1% to 2%. Hypotension and tumor lysis syndrome in less than 1%. So that's the end of my talk.